Hi, I'm Steve Robertson. I run Julian Krinsky Camps and Programs. We run programs for students from high school students from around the world. Today on Dov Barron's Leadership and Loyalty Show, I'm going to share with you some really interesting insights about why Gen Z matters to you as a parent or as a business. Stay tuned. Congratulations. You are tuned into Dov Barron's Leadership and Loyalty Show, the number one podcast for Fortune 500 executives and those who are dedicated to creating a quantum leap in leadership. Your host, Dov Barron, is the founder of FullMontyLeadership.com. He's an executive mentor to leaders like you, a contributing writer for Entrepreneur Magazine, CEO World, and he's been featured on CNN, Fox, CBS, and many other notable sites. Dov Barron is an international business speaker who was named by Inc. Magazine as one of the top 100 leadership speakers to hire. Now, over to Dov Barron. Welcome, dear friends, fans, and fellow aficionados of leadership excellence. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Dov Barron's Leadership and Loyalty Tips for Executives, part of the Full Monty interview series. But today we're going to take a look at, and actually an insider look at, what leaders of today must learn from kids who are actually under 20 years old if you want to thrive in the decades to come. If you're a new listener, new viewer to the show, strap yourself in. We're about to go full Monty. If you're a regular listener, a big thank you to you for making us the number one podcast globally for Fortune 500 listeners. And uh, we're also delighted that Inc.com cited us as the number one podcast for you to listen to if you want to be a better leader. Don't then probably tune out. Anyway, <laughs> listen, there are millions of podcasts out there, and thousands of them are focused on business and leadership, but there's only one show that focuses in on what's at the heart and soul of leadership. And you're tuned into it right here with me, Dov Barron. Remember, we need your help, so please share the show with everybody you know. We need your help to stay relevant, so go over to iTunes, rate, review, and subscribe to the show. It helps us a lot. All right, let's uh, let's strip it down and dive right in. If I can just keep these earplugs in, it would really help me. They're falling out, and I feel like some bad newsreader. Okay, as a leader, whether you're a CEO, C-suite individual, sales leader, entrepreneur, or leader in any capacity, no matter what level you're at in your organization, if you even if you're an entrepreneur, you know that due to global connectivity, more than any any other time in history. You are now working with, dealing with peers, employees, customers, clients who are not only across the globe, who are not only cross-cultural, but across generational, which is why not paying attention can feel a lot like you're herding cats, and that is not how to thrive. So stay tuned if you want to find out how to actually do that, because our guest today is Steve Robertson. He is the CEO of Julian Krinsky Camps and Programs, J. KCP organization, which specializes in the youth to adult programs that's turning curiosity into passion and skills. Steve oversees 20 plus programs and camps ranging from cooking and sports to pre-college academics and even robotics and TED talking and all kinds of amazing things. And they attract participants from around the world. JKCP partners together with highly esteemed institutions such as the University of Pennsylvania, Yale, and even the NFL. So Steve is an expert on youth development and education as well as understanding and adapting to youth. His experience comes full circle because he's a highly successful business leader who has to work with staff and clients who are indeed multi-generational and multicultural. And he puts it into maintain. He has to put that into maintaining the culture that they've set up around these pre-college training camps. Talk about having to herd cats. So, ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together and welcome Steve Robinson. Thank you, Dad. Thank you so much. Great to have you here, man. Well, let's Likewise. jump in. Who is Steve Robinson? What makes him tick? We'll start with a shallow wow. question. <laughs> yeah, right. That's that's deep end right there. Yeah. Well, um, Steve Robertson. So I, it depends who you ask. If you ask my wife, I'm sure you'll get a very different answer. But I'm someone who's really passionate about the youth. I'm excited about them. I'm lucky enough to work with them. I uh, moved from South Africa 20 years ago to the States and um, live in the Philadelphia area, which I love very much and have just been really thrilled and and blessed to be in the space where I work with kids and Gen Z specifically currently and 
I couldn't be happier. That's pretty cool. So, so help our audience understand what the JKCP programs are all about. Um, and just sort of as a general overview that we can get Thank a grasp you. of that. Yeah, indeed. So 40 years ago, Julian Krinsky actually happens to be a South African gentleman as well. Uh, played Wimbledon, played the French Open, fantastic tennis player, obviously also has a law degree, an accounting degree, decided to make the move from South Africa to Philadelphia. And 40 years later, him and his business partner, Adrian Castelli, um, they have built over the years just an amazing program, started with tennis, paid attention to their customers. We're always very much a customer-based business. What did they want? How do they want it? And it grew from tennis to golf to business. And and today, you know, you fast forward and, and the students change, the parents change, and we're presenting and sharing content today that is very far removed from 40 years ago, but still sure. with the same passion for, for the youth. So these are pre-college um, experiences. Um that range in time from one to four weeks, that's right? Yeah, very well said. So we rent space from universities. Uh, that's that's our, our, our main model or our model. So when the universities aren't in session over the summer, we have the ability to use their spaces, which is fantastic. And uh, we partner with some of the professors and such. So um, correct, one week, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, some of them, you know, some of them require four weeks, but there's a whole range depending a little bit on what it is you want to focus on. But what's interesting about it is, uh, this is uh, during the summertime when those professors would not be in college, but you actually engage those professors to come in who would normally be speaking at Yale or wherever it is, right, at the Wharton School of Business. Right. And they come in and work with this youth. And so in many, many cases, what happens with a professor specifically is they have a real passion to share the content that they have. Um, and they just don't always have the patience, and that might not be the right word, but to deal with all the bits and pieces of bringing something t together like that in the summer. And so we've had an opportunity on a number of different occasions to partner with them where they come in and they share that amazing content, and we do all the logistics and bring the students in and do, uh, do everything. And I think more and more universities are being stretched to, uh, one, bring pre-college students onto the campus so they can get a look and a feel. It's a bit of marketing before, of you course. know, yeah. um, and they generate income. So, you know, the, the dining services are no longer having to take a, a vacation. They can work because they're students on campus. So it's a kind of a win-win on so many levels. Yeah. So I have to ask, is this a program for the highly privileged or, or is actually other people, is it possible for others to go to this? And so a good question, tough question, especially in today's world. Um, mm -hmm. the, the good answer, the right answer is we have we have students from all sorts of backgrounds. And and um, the, the programs themselves are quite expensive, primarily because we have two sets of staff. Uh, we're in university, so it's like renting a hotel room and dining services and all those kinds of things. But the beautiful thing is that we have have in just about every single program that we have, we have scholarship opportunities. We look at all sorts of different components. Um so, yes, both sets of, of, of students, if you want to call it that, the privilege and those who don't have as much um, have the ability to and, in fact, do attend, which makes it a really, a really awesome opportunity. Yeah, I mean, I'm just wondering what it's like for like uh, I know that you we, you we were talking just before we started recording. And I know that you were on uh, you were watching live as I was doing one of my other shows. Right. And I talked about being the poor kid in a wealthy school. And I remember feeling like, you know, a bump on a log, feeling completely out of place yeah. in my secondhand uniform, secondhand shoes while the kids rolled up in their Bentleys, Rolls Royces and Jaguars. Uh, and I just wonder, you know, it was interesting for me because I know that that impacted me and some of it gave me some fire in my belly and some of it, right. you know, it, some of it was positive and some of it wasn't so positive. But I wonder what it's like. I mean, you know, you, your, your, your boots on the ground, you, you have your team boots on the ground. I wonder what it's like for those kids who are underprivileged to be around some of these kids who are, I mean, you have people who are very, very, very esteemed individuals, very high level, yep. you know, uh, come with the security team kind of people there. I wonder what it's like. Do you get that feedback? What it's like for those other kids to be in that environment? 
And so, Dar, that's a, a, first of all, it was a great story that you shared over the weekend. Thank you for your about your experience. One hundred percent. And you know what? The the we can't always change the scenario or the circumstances in which they arrive. Some arrive, as you say, in some really nice cars and are, are privileged and wealthy people. What I have seen is this: as soon as the parents, if they're involved, um, leave, and as soon as the programs start, we see very quickly how the youth start to connect with one another. You always have one or two of those that are stuck in those mindsets, but for the most part, and that's why I wouldn't want to speak on everybody's behalf, no, for, no. The, for the most part, these students that come to us don't take a long time to forget those things. And I forget may again not be the right way of saying it, but end up connecting with each other and getting to know each other for who they are more so than for what they have. Um, it's always going to be a challenge uh, trying to bring those kinds of students together. But the truth is we've seen it work really successfully. They're coming together in just about every single case because they are like-minded about certain things. And that's where they find the common interest and end up building friendships and relationships. And and so I celebrate that. Um, and I, I love the fact that for those students who aren't necessarily as – uh, fortunate as the others, they f they see very quickly that they do have a voice. They do have the ability to be in and around anybody. And it isn't just about what people have and don't have. Um, and, and I love to see that. I mean, that's that's one of those victories that are very hard to, to document and put in your marketing materials. But those are the real victories where a student has never had an opportunity like this and they have the opportunity and they do really well in it. A student hasn't stayed away from home before and they come and they make that experience successful, even though they there might have been some challenges along the way. Yeah, it's it, it's 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 a fascinating piece for me around the psychology of that because we are all conditioned that we are our circumstance, and we all we, anybody who's got any level of self awareness knows that we're not our circumstances, but we're all conditioned to believe that we're our circumstances. Right. And what is wonderful about this is that those kids can come in feeling like you know I'm a piece of crap or whatever it is because I didn't. You know, I don't go to that school or I don't have that kind of money. And now here I am with these kids who literally flew in by helicopter or got brought in for, on a private plane or whatever it is. And feeling, I mean, I can imagine because I talked about the story of me being a right. poor kid in a rich school, how vast the difference would feel, how what a massive chasm it would feel between those two people. And then what you're providing is this wonderful common ground where somebody can talk about their fascination with, you know, example, robotics, right, and be poor, and somebody else who's fascinated with robotics, who's wealthy, and the only thing that really matters is the fascination with robotics. And that commonality Absolutely. is so beautiful that you, you provide that, that wonderful place of glue to bond people. And I think that's fantastic, really outstanding. We love that. And, and uh, truthfully, in, in so many cases, that's what you see. As soon as we take the time to get to know each other, you find that there's so many more things in common than you would have imagined. And this generation specifically, uh, growing up as digital as they are, uh, are more removed than they've ever been with uh, from each other. And so when that opportunity is cultivated and percolates well, it's just it's really great. And, and you know, kids more so than adults in, in many cases um, they don't care as much about that stuff, and they do they do enjoy the opportunity and revel in it when they do find common ground. And they find common ground in places we would never think to look, which is amazing. Yeah. You know, many, let's sort of bring in this back to leadership for a moment in the context of what we're talking about. Many leaders really seem to struggle in dealing with two generations. Like I go in and I work with companies, and, you know, we're talking, I'm very often talking to the C-suite individuals. Uh, yep. At least, at least one to two thirds of that group might be. There's a good chance they're going to be baby boomers and Gen Xers, and then right. uh, then the newer members of the C-suite who are now 37 years old at the upper end are the the millennials. And you know, oftentimes it can feel like a different language for them that they're talking a different language. Your organization, you're dealing with baby boomers, Gen X's, millennials, <laughs> yeah. and Gen Z. What's your secret, mate? What is your secret? How, yeah. What is the secret to, to having this? Because yours is not only multi-generational, it's multicultural as well. What's the Correct. secret so that our leaders can learn this? 
So, Dov, I, I, I want to begin by saying that you speak a lot about what leadership looks like, feels like, and how to be a good leader. And I think that uh, the, one of the, the, the key foundations, regardless of the generations and the cultural mixes, is that those things are in place. And I think we're all striving to be good leaders. Uh, we have an amazing team in place, and our hierarchy may be a little flatter than most uh, corporate spaces would be. But the truth of the matter is, is that understanding what it is to be a good leader, and that's a great conversation. I've heard many talks from you on, on what that looks and feels like. And and I'm sure most of the people that are listening have have read about that kind of thing. So that's where it begins for us. But for us, I think the fact that we have so many generations involved and so many cultures involved actually makes it easier. It's not an outlier for us, but it's the norm. And right. so for us, what I, when I'm having a conversation with either a student who attends one of our programs or somebody who works for us in a full-time capacity or one of the hundreds of people that we bring on in a, in a temporary seasonal capacity during the summers, um, I, for me, the culture is a really big part of who we are. And the culture right. is, who are you? Uh, what is it that I want to communicate to you? And I, 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 we try and be really mindful about how we communicate with people. And it's easy to say the practice isn't always as, as easy, but, you know, communicating with a boomer versus an X versus a Z, there they are just certain parts that, that you've got to be aware of. Um, nev- and we're not taking the personality out of this either, right? No. So for us, I think it's a little bit easier um, because it's more of a norm. But I think we are very deliberate about paying attention to trying to ensure that the message we deliver, whether it be just checking in with somebody or whether it be a marketing message or a parent that we're trying to be really deliberate, that we're cognizant of who we're speaking to and that we're mindful about how they're receiving the information on an ongoing basis, not just at the end of my, my eulogy. (laughs) Do you think that, you know, I look at leadership and I look at old school leadership. So I'm going to, I'm going to be, generalize and forgive me folks for generalizing because then all generalizations are wrong because they are general there's always acceptance right. that are rule but when we talk about the greatest generation who are now you know in their 70s right um uh, then we talk about boomers but in both of those generations and to some degree even in the later exes there was a lot of command and control leadership style um then as we've moved to the younger gen x's and we've certainly moved into millennials that is not desirable whatsoever it's more collaborative leadership etc more servant leadership but part of the challenge in dealing with those multi-generational leaderships is often in the the older leaders who want to still do the command and control very often there's a micromanaging going on there and it's fascinating for me that i see and i really want to hear your input on this that i see the Younger leaders are frustrated by that. They're angered by that micromanaging. And then I watch them with their own children and they turn into helicopter parents and they're micromanaging <laughs> their kids. So they're uh-huh. not doing it. They, you know, they go, I don't want to be micromanaged. I want to feel like I'm in power of my own control of my own destiny. But you're micromanaging your own kids. You become this helicopter parent. Do you see that? Unfortunately, yes, um, more than I'd, and, and much more than I'd like to. And, and you know, I, I, as a parent, I'll say this. I'm sure we're all guilty as parents of at times doing that. And we justify it because we want the best for our kids and we have knowledge because we've lived and we've learned. Um, and so, I, you know, a couple of the scars that we enforce on our children by doing that, I think uh, for the most part, we turn out OK. The kids turn out OK. I, I do think that an excess of that is extremely damaging, extremely damaging. And, and within a leader and or a parent, I think you uh, it, it's clear the damage it does. When you see it in leaders, what you'll find really quickly is that millennials and the, the, the old disease will not stay in the company. They'll leave. And it's OK as a boomer to say, well, then let them leave. But once you start counting the cost of what it takes to onboard somebody and then let them go, you realize very, very quickly that that's not a good strategy. You also realize that in most businesses, if you're not looking at the G, uh, at the Gen Z generation for your market, no matter what you're selling, whether it's a good or a service, you're mistaken if you're you're not already considering them. They're already influencing the the spending immensely. So a, a boomer who's who's in charge and has that, that kind of command and control sage on stage mentality 
will see very quickly if they're not already the impact on their bottom line. And, and I hope the fact that they are leaders will get them to a place where they'll say, Dov, I need help. Come in and talk to us. Or they'll, you know, they'll, they'll have a sidebar conversation to realize that my business isn't what it used to be. What do I need to do to stay current? Um, and so we totally see, we absolutely see that. And to answer your question, yes, at home and in the workplace. And unfortunately, I'm seeing more of it um, than I would hope we would see of it. You know, but you and I had a conversation off air, and one of the things you said to me that was profound was that parents, uh, you know, maybe the, the term the helicopter parents, but parents are kind of scared because they're, there's this feeling that they're losing uh, influence over their children. Talk to us a little bit about that, because that was when you said that was like I, I made you stop and I wanted to write that down because it was Amen. I think it's Come something on. that that people really have to pay attention to, not just as parents, but as leaders. And this is a fascinating piece, because to me, parenting and leadership are completely aligned. It's part yeah. of the work that I do is I always say to people, you want to be a leader, be a decent parent. And they're like, well, what do you mean? I'm cool. <laughs> you have to really think about being a good parent. Yeah. So, so talk to us about it because that was a fascinating piece. I love that that part of the conversation, Doug, because um, when the realization hit me that the the Gen, the Gen Z demographic, they are looking to their international peers for affirmation, for input on what to buy, where to buy it, how to behave, how to dress – far more than any generation ever has and probably that we we, we will see the impact of that uh, from a buying perspective and, and in a major way. And, and so what we're seeing because of the digital life they're able to live, they're able to connect with people are across, across the world that are their peers and have conversations with them. Parents, it's interesting. There was an article, and I'm not going to quote the, the person because I, I, I forget her and I don't know how to say her name, but she she's just written a book called iGen. And one of her comments was about how uh, this generation are staying at home longer, waiting longer to get their driver's license, taking longer to have sex, drugs, and rock and roll and alcohol, which is that's a good thing, right? But part of the reason is because – um, their parents are providing this safe space. But what they don't realize as a parent is that their son or daughter is sitting in their bedroom on their phone, on their screen, and they're getting input from their peers. And they are further away from their parents than they've ever been. The generations that were out at the parties or doing this or that were closer to their parents than this generation that's right under their roof. And part of the thing is because uh, the, the, the Zs are looking – for confirmation from their parents and aren't getting it. So what you're seeing is parents um, are flocking towards Instagram and Facebook and all those kinds of things. If you look at the demographics, I think the in the last six months, selfie, the most common selfie was by a female between the age of 40, uh, older than 43. Uh, face, uh, Instagram, the biggest growth is between the age of 40 and 60 and Facebook between 40 and 60. Why? Because those parents are flocking there to try and be part of their kids' lives. The kids are fleeing and getting onto things like Snapchat that are closed environments that they can be who they want to be. And so um, I think that the realization that if you aren't deliberate as a parent and if you aren't figuring out ways to connect with your kids – and employees in a yep. meaningful way, they don't need you. They're not knocking on your door asking you to connect. They are already connecting with their peers around the world. They are uh, they are more lonely than, than they've ever been. I read an article about a young girl who spent her entire summer on the bed. The bed was concaved, not literally, because that's all she did was spend her time there on a screen. Now, she's lonelier, but she's feeling connected to all these people uh, in, in a digital way. So as a leader and a parent, Deliberate is the word that I want to use because you have to be deliberate about connecting, collaborating, being part of your employee and or your child's life that isn't a helicopter parent. Because if you are, they shut you off and they get onto things like Snapchat where they can lock you out. And you'll see one of two things. You'll see a kid walk up to – uh, to us to talk about a, a program. And you'll see the student who is just standing in the background, arms folded and letting mom do everything because mom does everything. Mom will drive me to the store. Mom will buy me this, buy me this. And they are just passengers. And that is a sad, sad, sad state of affairs because they need to learn how to fail. They need to step yeah. out. They need to know how to make a phone call. And so that's the thing that worries me most about parents and or leaders not taking the time to connect and really understand 
They have to. And it, I know it can be a bother as a leader because it's hard work. It yeah. can be a bother as a parent. It's hard work. But if you don't do it with these Zs, we are going to lose a generation in a way that we've never lost a generation before. You know, one of the things I've talked a lot about um, on these shows and on other shows is in the generation in the generations before, it's always been about skills and tactics, um, because there was as as bumpy as it was, as uh, sometimes raw as it was, there was a level of communication skill because you interacted with people eyeball to eyeball. And that was just how you hung out. And that's how you did it. And as you were saying there, one of the things that I think we've got to realize is that your kids' best friends may be in Africa and you Indeed. live in, in, in the UK. Your kid's best friend might be living in New Zealand or China or wherever the heck it might be, and you live in a completely different country. Right. And so understanding that, you know, I, I think that there's a level, as you talked about in the parent of anxiety of like, oh, my God, I'm losing contact connection with my kid. But I think that we polarize that and we become these right. crazy controlling parents. But when you shift it back into the leadership thing, you know, it's one of the things that I've talked so much about is that I think that because we had those positions, you know, we, we did do the eyeball to eyeball is that we, the soft skills are more important than they've ever been, that we must learn those soft skills. And the problem is that we take a lot of stuff for granted. And I've always said this for years, and you and I talked about this, is that there's something called assumptive knowledge and that you assume because you know it, everybody knows it. And it's I not the case particularly across generations. And unless you are willing to put the time and the energy and the effort in to, to having those soft skills develop, you're going to have a bunch of people who do not really know how to connect with each other, other than digitally, who do not know how to render conflict, that if conflict comes up, you can't afford to have two co-workers who may be in different com uh, uh, cultures, right. you can't afford to have one of them suddenly ghost the other because that's what they can do on Instagram or Snapchat or a dating, but that's how they operate. Oh, it's conflict. Okay, I'll just ghost you. Uh, no, this is a business. And if we don't learn those soft skills, we're in trouble. And I really believe that in many ways, it is these younger generations that can teach us the, the negative value of that, meaning because we're gonna have to live with the negative consequences and we've got to recognize the value of bringing that forward. Do you see that? Oh, yeah. And so it's a, it's, uh, I celebrate so much about Gen Z. I, I am I'm really passionate about them. And I, I, I often ponder, I'm a science fiction fan, amongst many other things. And I often ponder, you. well, maybe tomorrow's world is just like that. Maybe tomorrow's world isn't eyeball to eyeball. Maybe it is just a digital connection as this. And, and although the X's and the generations before, and truthfully, even the millennials wouldn't be excited about that. Well, maybe it is what tomorrow looks like, but I can tell you that between today and tomorrow, there's a good few years that are gonna come, come and go. And the reality is we are innately passionate about connecting with people, mm -hmm. even if, so, so I don't think that's gonna disappear. I don't think you can unteach that. I think that's, I, I believe we're wired like that. And so something as simple as, Instead of having a pizza ordered at home online, tell your son or daughter to pick up the phone and make the call. Now, that's not eyeball to eyeball, but it's a step in that direction. And, and so that's why I really believe that opportunities for, for generations or companies to collaborate and to, 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 to bring the, this cross-cultural competency into a space where there is this eyeball-to-eyeball opportunity, you're forcing them to learn those kinds of skills. Will they be necessary tomorrow? Maybe not, but I think they will. I think they will. I think they'll always be necessary. But um, I think it's critical that those, and, and I, th that those are taught and practiced. Do I agree with you that we're seeing them go fall by the wayside right now? I really do. But I think what's going to happen very quickly is that um, parents and Gen Z themselves are going to realize that there's a shortage in that area. And they're going to take steps to correct that. And I, and I hope it's soon. And I think it's critical. Well, I, I mean, I hope you're right. But I'm, I've got to be honest, I'm not entirely confident in that. 
And, and the reason is because, you know, the analogy I give is if you and I grow up in a village where two and two is five, then two yeah. and two is five. And it's right. always five. So if I buy this for two and I buy this for two in your store, and I live in the, in the town where two and two is five, I give you five and I don't get any change. And because that's what's normal. And so if, if we don't keep, if we don't step in now, I don't see any reason why at so, in two generations from now, we just go, what are you talking about eye to eye? I don't understand. I do eye to eye. I see each other through the screen. Yeah. What about flesh to flesh? Well, I don't have sex with these people. No, no, actually shaking a hand. What are you talking about? I don't know why it wouldn't go that way because, I, you know, we're, and I think it's interesting, as I've said many times, we have more connective devices and we're less connected than we've ever, ever been. Absolutely. And this is a problem. However, from the context of business and leadership, what can leaders today learn from observing because this is a big thing for you is, is you're very good at observing the behaviors of gen z which are for those of you not knowing are the 17 year olds and younger what is what is it that leaders can learn today as we sit here in 2017 what is it we can learn from observing those younger generation who are coming out of high school or entering into college what is it we can learn from them now yeah so that is probably a that is a monster question i um come from a country where they drive on the correct side of the road and, <laughs> me too <laughs> right so for the first few years that i lived here my my message to everybody was you're on the wrong side of the road and it came to a, a point where i realized that it wasn't worth me taking time to share that message because i was not going to convince everybody that that was the case um, so, <laughs> right uh so you know i say that to say this that as as a leader looking at this generation as a business looking at this generation there's certain waves that i can't fight or defeat right. so what i get excited about I get excited about making sure that we package things in such a way that we give people a taste. And when I say people, I'm talking about Gen Z, a taste of what they're missing and the delight. And let's say watching students Gen Z blossom in those environments when they do get together, when they do have an opportunity to be face to face, eyeball to eyeball, shake hands. I hope and pray that that's what it, all it takes for them to be able to start to pursue that more and to make sure that this legacy that we're talking about now doesn't die going forward. And as a, as a business owner, someone who's involved in, in working with that generation, I think it's critical to package, to think about how they most like to receive information because we can spend all day telling them they're driving on the wrong side of the road. What I want them to see is that there is – not necessarily a better way, but there's a way that you may not have had a lot of experience. And as you start to experience that, I really just believe life is fuller. And we've seen it over the years, just seeing how people do blossom uh, when they have this opportunity. And I think there's still enough of it around. There's still enough boomers and exes and the silent generation around that instill those values um, in their grandchildren and children and, and friends as they go. So I don't think we're at the point yet where it's going to be lost. I also want to look at the the tide and try not swim against the tide but um but give opportunities on the side that will expose kids more gen z more to things that they haven't necessarily experienced in the way that we have so um, what we can learn right i mean as uh, as boomers and, and older gen x's there's a lot we can learn from observing these gen z gen z yeah. right so, oh, yes. So what what I mean, because, you know, you, you talked to me about this before that. I don't you know, I, I, thought, I thought it was a really interesting part is that I don't think we and when I say we, I mean, my generation recognize because we, we've always thought about influence being up, down. Right. So, you know, my grandparents influenced my parents, my parents influenced me, I influenced my children. Right. And now we're seeing, as we talked about before, peer to peer influence. Um, but even more importantly, one of the things you were talking about was the influence that Gen Z uh, is having on on the Gen X and on the uh, on, on the boomers, like you talked about with the selfies yeah. and all the rest of it. 
But they're right. also teaching us things about buying, right? They're teaching us about if you're going to be in business, you're going to be a leader. And if you're in business, you're selling something. Right. What are Gen Z teaching us about buying? So I love that. Again, thank you for, for going there. If we don't pay attention to how they want to buy and what they want to buy, we won't stay in business. So the the beautiful thing is there are a couple of companies that do an incredible job of giving uh us and Gen Z, the opportunity to buy online, which is where they want to buy. So you'll have an exa in the in the room and he'll say, oh, I need to go and try on that pair of shoes. And Zappos says, don't worry about it. If it's wrong, we'll switch it. You don't have to pay for, for, for it to be sent to you or sent back. We'll take care of it. And the Zs are showing it's okay. It's okay to buy a pair of shoes and send them back back and forth once or twice, chances are you get it right and it'll be okay. It's okay to put your credit card online, no matter how much things seem to be falling apart out there, it's okay to do those kinds of things. And as, as you said, and the, the parents are starting to go to that space because they're also starting to see what it is to be creative. They're also starting to see like, I may not have been a particularly good artist growing up. Your teacher gives you a pencil and says, draw this. And I'm like, oh, I'm horrible. But in today's world, Z can do that and be a horrible artist, but still create incredible things. They can publish a book or a video. And I think what they're teaching us is that there's a courage, there's an entrepreneurship, there is a there is a contagious creator spirit within them, which impacts how you buy, what you like, how you make decisions. Um, it's okay to read a review and see that that person that hotel let's say that hotel was wonderful without having to speak to somebody who's been to that hotel and says yes go there they start to show that 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 i call them contagious creators but those contagious sharers have value and are sharing and so uh there i think what z is teaching me in a business sense is you don't have to be scared of the future because it can be paralyzing thinking like how do i keep abreast of all this information mm-hmm. how do i st- and they teaching us uh, in so many ways that it's okay because we're figuring it out as we go. So can you. Um, and that's why it's so important to have these people not only working with you, but it, that's why it's important to pay attention to who they are and what they're doing, how they buy, what they like to buy. And it's okay if they've got a pair of Uggs that are the ugliest shoes you've ever seen before you know it, everybody's wearing them. And I know Uggs have got, come and gone already, but it's just a quick example that came to mind. So as a business um, – they're teaching us a lot. They're teaching us how to be mobile. They're teaching us how to uh, how to fulfill things quickly. They're showing us that it's okay to, to like more than one thing or to have one more than one personality. I have a certain personality or predisposed way that I behave at work and I behave a little bit different when I'm on the tennis court. And, I've, and, and that's okay. You don't have to be a clone necessarily of what your mom and dad um, are. They're also showing us that uh, there is a lot of knowledge to be had out there. And if we as businesses and leaders are that sage on stage? Well, very often they'll correct you. Actually, that's not correct. Um, I Googled it and the actual number is 34. They're like, oh. Um, and so it's showing you that knowledge is not the important thing, is not as important, should I say, as knowing how to lead the, the, the troop, how to lead right. the students, right. how to lead the, the team that you have. I'm excited. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's very interesting. I mean, so – being the guy that you are running this organization that you run with all these multi-generationals and multi-culture, we're a leadership show. What do you see as the state of leadership today? Uh, you know, because the people who tend to be in leadership have tended to be older. We're seeing much younger ones moving to those positions, which is wonderful. But what do you see as the general state of leadership? And, and, we could be talking political. We could be talking corporately. I mean, we could talk at all kinds of levels, even educational. Um, what do you see as the as the general state of leadership? I think if, I I hope every generation would say this that the leaders of today need to be investing in learning, growing, um, becoming a 2.0 version of who they are, like never before. And I hope every generation has been has been saying that I feel like our leaders need to be called into a higher destiny than they've ever been. And the reason I say that is because 
the the Z's and the – do you notice how I say Z instead of Z? That just rolls for me. That's yeah. one of the things I've accepted. Left-hand side of the road, right-hand side of the road, Z works yeah. for me. So, so, the, so bringing those people into the workplace is going to require a different level of leadership. And so wow. I really see that there's a lack of 2.0 leaders out there <laughs> as, a, as a bad version of explaining what I want. And I think that there are leaders out there that are committing to the process, committing to the journey of becoming somebody that they weren't yesterday in order to be the leaders they need to be tomorrow for this generation. Those are the com- companies, those are the businesses that are going to be around for generations because you have to have to be aware. And so for me, it starts with, are you always evaluating how you're leading and are you truthfully getting some outside input in terms of how to lead? Because if you ask me, how do I lead? I'm awesome. But if you had to ask around, maybe I'm not as awesome. And I think with the, sure. the, the content that there is out there today, um, there is just so much that, that you can learn about who you are and who you need to be. So um, I, I feel like I heard a story a friend told me once. He, he's, a, he's a surveyor. So he's walking in an area where he has to survey and it's in the heart of summer. And he goes past a little pond and the pond is really dried up and there's a little fish that is um, in this little pond. And you can see that it's just a matter of time until that dries up and this thing dies. And it's in its last, you know, attempt to, 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 to cling to life going crazy. And I feel like there's some leaders that are in that place where they're just clinging to what they knew and what they have and what they had because they don't really know where to go. Mm-hmm. And if Z has taught us anything, don't settle for where you are today. There are other options. Look and find. If nothing else, because it's boring where I am today, I'm tired of what I'm doing today. If nothing else, for that reason, I hope and pray leaders would be out there knocking on doors and challenging who they are. And I think it starts uh, as an internal thing. Before you change all those who work for you, um, I think it's it's worth having a good look at who you are and how you lead. And and I, I think that's the state of it. Not enough people are in that place yet. Yeah. I agree. I think that too few people actually take the time to look, to create self-knowledge. However, you know, um, I would really, at this point, I would like to do a cutaway. We can't, but I'd like to do a cutaway <laughs> in a future show um, where we interview a 10-year-old, a 15-year-old, and a 20-year-old and ask them, what do you think of the quality of leadership today? Because I'll tell you, some, I'm very interested in, in, as you know, you and I have had conversations about, this, about politics and where we're going and all the rest of it. And, and I was fascinated to read some statistics recently that said um, that about one third of young millennials, so those are you know, the people who are 17 to 25, um, think that freedom of speech is not that important. Uh, that they're shushing people who are politically incorrect, uh, you know, and and I think we this is what concerns me. This is what concerns me. I'm like, holy crap! I mean, every generation has fought for more freedom, it seems, and in many ways, the where we're going is actually away from that freedom. Because listen, I don't like what the alt right has to say, but I'm never going to shut them up. I don't want to shut them up. In fact, I would create more attention for them. What I actually want to do, I would stand and fight for their rights. I love what Noam Chomsky did when he stood up and fought for the rights of a neo-Nazi to say that there was no Holocaust. Now, does he believe that? No, but he believes in the right to free speech. And, and it's a very interesting situation when we have generations now who are, of course, as you said, massively impacted by their online presence, who are being fed a bubble, because we know that that's how social media works. It finds your preferences and sends you the stuff inside of your preferences when, in fact, I actually want stuff that's not in my preferences right? Um, because I'm a thinker and I want to think. It's a concern for me when I think about leading a generation who are going to be born in a bubble and live in a bubble. And I really... It's one of the things I like about your programs. It's one of the reasons I want to have you on this show is because you're exposing kids to things beyond their bubble. I like that. But do you see that concern? Is that a concern you see when you're interacting with these kids? 
So not so much in the interaction because of when I do get an opportunity to inter interact with them, it's in this kind of environment. But I, I, I totally recognize that. And I guess in my, my romantic view of this, and that's dreaming ahead, I really, I really believe uh, there's a number of statistics out that this Z generation are going to be the most self-employed generation that we've ever seen. Absolutely. Um, and so what I, to, uh, the, the parallel I draw there is if they are going to be self-employed, they can't live in a bubble. At that point, as soon as you start to to present a product or a service, you have to start looking at things outside of your bubble. You also have to start looking at things you don't like. I don't like to serve, uh, I don't like a specific race and I am at a restaurant, well, you'll serve them if you want to do good business and it's just a silly example. So I hope that there will be some kind of a balance there. I do believe that the bubble is real. I do believe it's real and I think that's why helicopter parents or allowing your son or daughter to stay in the house and not get a job outside of the house instead doing a side hustle online um, to make a little bit of money, I think that's a mistake. I think that's why failure, making mistakes is a mistake, not, not letting your, your children make mistakes is a mistake because that's where you start to test boundaries, establish who you are and get a voice. And I think it is critical to get a voice. I think it's imperative to have our generation, not only they are a smart, smart generation, but I'm, I want them to be able to articulate what they really think about a certain thing and not just stand in the background and be quiet and let mom and or dad do the talking. So do we see it? Yes, we do see it. Do I hope that it's that it's it's going to be somewhat short lived? And as soon as they get to the stage where they have to be at college, um, assuming college is still not a, it's not only an online thing anymore, which I, I believe is still quite a ways away. Um, those kinds of things, they will, I hope, figure out how to 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 be themselves, because ultimately clones are boring. Every movie you ever see about clones, nobody wants them, right? We want no, people to be no. individuals. We want them to be able to express themselves. I, I, and I think we 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 will continue to see that. And I, I, I agree that there is a challenge with that, especially early on with disease. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a very fascinating thing for me because the ability to, you know, when we used to uh, watch things like the Manchurian Candidate, we thought about yeah. brainwashing, um, as somebody who understands psychology and particularly understands influence, for me, it's fascinating to see how easy it is to indoctrinate today, yeah. far easier than it was. I mean, you know, I was yeah, listening okay. to somebody speak last week and saying about, you know, if you were some kind of um, sexual, quote, freak uh, who liked to do weird things with, with another, you know, other individuals or other animals or whatever it is, you know, whatever lights your candle, and I'm not here to judge it. But you did that, you did that kind of like, you know, very quietly. And now you've got a freaking community. And if you're a person who, who didn't like Jews or blacks or Muslims or whatever it was, you, you know, you might have had a small community of other people who were not particularly well wishers that you could secretly hang out with. But now you have a whole community online and, and the possibility of indoctrination, as we're seeing with extreme behavior, whether it's extreme right uh, extreme right wing of the alt right, or whether it's Antifa with the extreme left, or whether it's extreme uh, radicals, whether it's extreme radical Christians or Muslims or whatever it might be. So it's it's a it's a real that is a concern for me when I speak to these kids, because yeah. I I do believe in them and I do believe that they've got so much to offer, but I think that our part is in making sure that we do the eyeball to eyeball. And, and not helicoptering, because we think that that's eyeball. I just want to be around my kid. Well, mm. no, actually, you're stuffing, you're stifling. You become the smothering mothering. You know, it's not the answer. Now, before we, we're moving into the last part of the show here, and I want to ask you, because you're very successful, you've come through the ages, you're watching all these things grow, you've watched them develop. But I think that oftentimes we, we think that people make it overnight. We like to think that people are different than us. But the truth of the matter is, as many people know, I had a fall. I fell off a mountain, got smashed to pieces, and there was a change in the direction of my life. Sometimes the fall is literal, like mine was. Sometimes the fall is more metaphorical, whether it's a divorce or a bankruptcy or whatever it might be. Can you think of an example that has been a fall for you, that changed the direction for you, something that might have seemed pretty horrible at the time, but now you go wow, that I really needed that, that was a turning point in my life, some part where you really struggled? 
So uh, I guess all of us have have um, stories like that to tell, as, as you suggested, some are significantly bigger than others. And I feel like if I have to look back at at my walk, um, there have been a number of those little, uh, some of them have been small, some of them have been a little bit bigger. And, and um, that have been somewhat, uh, should we say, pivot points in my life. Um, the silliest one at high school, I was horrible at math until I bumped into a math teacher who beat me at, if I didn't learn the theorems. And within the last two years of high school, I became really good at math. It was amazing how he changed my focus, unfortunately, or fortunately. And so, um, that was one silly little example that I really cling to because if you feel like you're not strong in a certain era, I think there's the, you know, you, you certainly could be. Um, I think that, you know, for, for us as a family and for me, the move um, from South Africa where I'd grown up and had a major infrastructure and had um, everything that I'd, I'd known to a place that spoke almost the same language in, in, in the almost, USA. Yeah. yeah, almost, and had nothing in common. That was a real um, opportunity to reinvent myself. And when I w- went through that process, I realized a lot of things about myself. And I guess I'm always doing those, uh, realizing those things where I was ashamed of uh, certain behaviors or attitudes. And um, and so this, you know, it's like you were changing schools that often gives you a chance to re- recreate yourself a, a, mm-hmm. a little bit. Um, so that, that experience was not something, you know, that people would necessarily f- feel as as crazy as falling off a mountain and being at, at death's door and coming back and, and now, but, but it was a really deep experience for us because it, at the end of the day, you re- I realized very quickly that as many amazing people as we had around us to, to help us walk through the situation, you're, you're quite alone out there. Um, and at the end of the day, you have to, to make things work. I, so how did that, to, how did that change your, your own leadership or business philosophy? It Even if it was, wasn't until later when you realized it. So to me, it was just really a humbling experience. And, and I think the the thing that I um, learned most from that experience is that I, you know, at the age of 21, I thought I knew everything. At the age of 23, I totally knew everything until I got to 25 and looked back. And, and so I realized that um, – It was a really humbling experience that I didn't know everything and I didn't have all the answers. And in fact, my strategies and systems and ways that I went about leading uh, weren't always the best. And so what I I hope it has made me um, is just much more open. I won't say humble because that's not humble to say humble, but much more open to really connecting with people on a sincere level. Um, I, I'm a serial connector. I love connecting with people, but, but, but truly listening to who they are. I, I, Quick aside story, I was at a, at a meeting once, I was speaking to a gentleman face to face like this, and I caught myself seeing somebody behind him that I valued more. And so here I was with this thing where I wanted to get away from this conversation I was in and spend time talking to him. And I just had this epiphany that take the time with the person who's in front of you, be 100% committed to them. And invest in them. It doesn't, that person will be there. And even if they're not, if you want to be authentic and real as a person, do the things that it's, that's valuable to me. Um, so that was a real moment for me in a silly little environment. Um, and it has really impacted me. I've been, I try to really be very deliberate about that. And I think that's part of that learning experience. I want people when they are with me to be interested in me. I want them to be committed to the conversation um, and be authentic, if that's a, a good word to use in that environment. And um, that's an ongoing battle, a daily battle, but it, I think it's a, it's a sincere desire of mine. But for me, it's, it's an even bigger concern today than it's ever been because it's like we carry around this thing in our pocket. Yeah. And, and it's like a constant doorbell ringing. Right. So, you know, it's, it's fascinating to me because, you know, exactly what you're just saying, you know, you're standing, you're having a conversation with somebody and better people arrive, and, yeah. you know, and your eye goes there and your mind goes there and you get it. But now people don't have to walk in the room, right? This pings and, you know, and somebody sending you a text, it's your Instagram went off, it's your, your Twitter went off, it's whatever it is. And there's a thousand different pulls in a, in a thousand different directions that people are not there. I watched myself last night. Uh, my son was here with his with his fiance and they're, they're sitting around with us and they're talking about something. And I looked up 
and my my wife and my son are having a conversation and I looked over at my daughter-in-law and she's on her phone checking her Instagram and I thought what the hell is she doing and then I realized my phone was in my hand yeah, and I was yeah. checking Twitter or whatever it was right so you know it's 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 a very it's concerning because as much as you and I may have that discipline to say you know put the phone down no the generations to come, that doorbell is going to get more profuse. It's it's a fascinating thing. I want to quickly move on because we're getting towards the end of the show. I want to ask you, I believe that successful people are obsessed. And we have a lot of negative connotations around that word, but I think we are. I think we're, we're obsessed. Uh, and when I say obsessed, I don't mean it negatively. I mean, if there's a conversation going on about something, you can't resist. You have to jump in, even if you're not part of that conversation. If there's a movie on and it's got a bit about that thing you're obsessed about, you have to watch it. And it's the bit you'll talk about. What is Steve oh. obsessed with? Dove, I, unfortunately, or fortunately, so many things I can't even tell you. I am like, <laughs> really, I, I've got that kind of personality. I'm in and I'm in 100%. But the truth is, I'm really passionate about culture. I'm really passionate about calling people into their destiny. Now, that's something that's happened in my life more recently than, than before, where I really want to, when I look at people, I see what I believe they should be. Now, am I right? Am I wrong? I don't know. But I, I'm really passionate about calling people into their destiny. Um, I'm passionate about having people achieve and not settle for, and not settle, let's say that. Um, I'm passionate about connecting with people. And probably that's my biggest passion is I just really want to connect with people. And I'm getting better and better at learning to connect with them and figure out who they are as opposed to deliver everything that I've got on my agenda. So that's something I'm continuing to work on. But I am really passionate about that. The more people I connect with, the more fascinated I become with all their journeys, their passions, their uh, what it is that drives them. And somehow, you know, it's like travel. I love traveling and I, and I have the opportunity to travel quite a bit. And traveling does something to me. And in the same way, connecting, and when I say connecting, I mean really connecting with someone. Even if it's just a cup of coffee at a Starbucks, that five or ten minutes, or if it's a long-time friend, that time can be spent incredibly well pouring into someone's life or just connecting with them on, on, on a wonderful basis. So off the top of my head, those are a couple of things. I'm crazy about sport. I'm crazy about people. I'm crazy about this generation. I'm crazy about the time we're living in. And there's a bunch of things that I'm, I complain about as well. But for the most part, that's uh, what I would guess. What is the one thing you hope that leaders will take away from this conversation? Some, you know, what is the one practical thing you hope they will really take away from this? Dov, it's to be deliberate. We can talk and read and do all sorts of things. I know when you come into a company and share some wisdom with them, that is amazing. If they do not deliberately implement and pursue what it is you've shared with them, they will not see the outcome that you've presented. And so I want I want personally to be deliberate today in doing the things I know I should do, have the conversations I know I should have, and be the person just one step at a time. If it is getting fit, I want to just be deliberate today about going and working out. Um, and that's what leaders I really hope would be, just deliberate one step at a time, taking the time to be more intentional and deliberate about the people who work for you, getting to know and calling them into a bigger destiny. Because if they can grow into a bigger destiny in your company, everybody wins. Absolutely. Well, Steve, this has been a fascinating conversation. Thank you, my friend. Appreciate you having you here. And thank you for giving us this, this window into not only millennials, which we've talked a lot about on this show, but in the generation to come, which uh, are already emerging which is the Generation Z, Generation Z, depending on where you are in the world, <laughs> you know, and, and, and really giving us that, that sense that we, we've got a lot to learn from them. I want to really thank you for that. It's been great yeah. having you here. Thank you, sir. Thank you for having me, Don. It's, it's really great, been a great pleasure. Please tell our, 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 our listeners, our viewers, where they can find out more about you and about the programs and all the things that you do. So uh, jkcp.com, and if you go forward slash – um, lead loyal, I believe is the URL. Um, there's some footnotes. Um, we can give you for those people that are interested in sending any of their, their children or grandchildren to any of our experiences. There's a special discount there for you. But as I said, I'm a serial connector. There's a number of articles I've written there. Uh, find me on any of the platforms. I, <laughs> the doorbell will ring and I'll be very excited to answer it. I am very excited to connect with people and learn as we go. So that's probably the easiest way to find me. 
Fabulous. We'll make sure that the URL is posted on the show notes Thank you. so that you can get all those folks. And I do encourage you to reach out to, to Steve, find out more about these amazing programs. As I said, you know, they, they, they cover things from academics to sports to robotics to even how to do a TED Talk or learn how to blog, or learn how to podcast. Fascinating, really, really fascinating and a great way for you to have the generation that come get more connected with each other and with uh, with what the, what's going on in a world that, and get out of that bubble. I really appreciate Steve and what you're doing with your programs. Thank you, sir. I want to thank you, dear listener, dear viewer, for joining us today. Thank you for tuning in and thank you for taking action on what it is that we've shared with you today. And I hope that you'll reach out to Steve and uh, and find out more from him. And remember, the, the research consistently shows that one of the biggest challenges facing the most successful companies is somewhat counterintuitive. It's exactly what Steve talked about before, because these uh, companies are discovering that they're fast growing and they're spending an absolute fortune on training and developing top talent. And then they're going, well, you know, I, I, let, let, I don't care. Let them go. Well, it costs you a fortune. Mm -hmm. If you're sick of, of investing in training, development in your talent and not having that ROI, then reach out to us at fullmontyleadership.com where we provide the essential leadership skills to rekindle and amplify the hidden loyalty assets of your organization by tapping into your deep purpose fullmontyleadership.com providing you with the concrete soft skills to get you and your organization to the top and keep you there why very simple because you can't outsource authenticity I also want to remind you to go and stop by matrix.fullmontyleadership.com, matrix like the movie, dot fullmontyleadership.com, matrix.fullmontyleadership.com, and get your authentic leadership matrix self-assessment tool. It's valued at $197, and you get it absolutely free for joining us on the show today. Appreciate it. So get yourself over there and uh, take that self-assessment. Till next time, this is Dov Barron at Full Monty Leadership saying, stay curious, my friend, stay curious about what the next generation and the one after can teach you about how to lead. Till next time, this is Dov Barron and I am out.